All right, this is Mr. Volkman with another flip video lesson. We're gonna be starting a couple flip videos here on slavery in the southern states in the 1800s. The first flip video is gonna cover multiple lessons. In fact, this flip video will cover lessons 20.4 through 20.7. And this is gonna look at the day-to-day -day inside um, idea of what a slave's life would have been like in the southern states in the 1800s. I have not handed out an outline to you guys. What I would like you to do is go to Edmodo and look at the questions that you need to answer. And as you're watching the video, as I'm sure you normally do, please answer those questions. This is an, a video meant for educational purposes, so please don't be afraid to pause the video if there's anything you do not understand or something you just missed. Let's begin, shall we? Now, I have a note, something that's really important that we, we need to talk about and understand before we can continue with anything else on any of the flip videos for chapter 20. And that's the idea that slaves were property in the South. And they are treated like that. Now take a moment, I want you to think about that. In fact, I kind of want you to pause the video and I want you to think about different items in your own home that you view as property, okay? Pause the video, think of two things. I hope you pause the video or else you're gonna be really bored watching me tap my chin. Now, property isn't worth a lot. We definitely don't view property as like a human. Now, with that in mind, when humans work and live really close together, we're bound to make relationships with one another. That's just part of being a human being. Whether or not we view the person as a human, we're they are, and we interact that way. However, even if there is a relationship that happened between the slaves and the owners, there was never a sense of equality. There was always a sense of, I'm the owner and I'm better than you. Even if, you know, I maybe sort of kind of like you, which didn't necessarily always happen. The first thing I want to talk about with the slaves' life was what the working conditions were like. We need to know that most slaves actually worked in farms or plantations. In fact, the 90% of the slaves in the southern states worked in farms and plantations of all sizes. However, there were slaves that did work in cities as well. In fact, in cities in the south, 20% of all populations in the southern cities were at least made up of slaves. Sometimes, the majority of a population of a city was made up of slaves. There was one city, I believe it was either in South Carolina, Carolina or Georgia, where that was actually the case. Now, when they were working, you could see slaves working in the fields, which what the pictures that I have here show. They also worked in homes as servants. They worked in different industries as laborers. They also could have worked in transportation fields. I'd like to take a moment now and actually talk about some of the responsibilities that slaves had while they worked on the plantation, namely what they did out in the fields. Plantation work was extremely hard. Uh, the workers, the slaves were up before dawn and they worked well until after sunset. They were given two hours during lunch, uh, during noontime for lunch. However, all in all, they did work 18 hour days. Some of the different things they did during the day was that they would harvest and plant crops. They would clear the land and dig ditches. In fact, it's really important to note that it was these field hands who were the backbone to the plantation economy. Without these workers, plantations more than likely would not have earned as much money as they had. These guys did all the work for the owners. Um, slaves also fixed buildings and tools. They became mechanics, blacksmiths, carpenters, whatever was needed, they did it. They also cut and hauled wood However, they were under constant supervision and threat of physical punishment if they didn't do the job fast enough or well enough. Women did all of these jobs, plus they also cared for their own family with cooking, childcare, sewing, so their responsibilities were even doubled. I thought you might find it interesting that children as young as three to four were also put to work. They were um, people who would weed fields, they would carry drinking water for workers. They would help in the kitchen. And then between the ages of 7 and 12, they were put working hard work like the adults 
in the fields. There were slaves who didn't always work out in the fields. Some worked in the house as servants. Now, housework in some aspects wasn't necessarily as physically demanding as out in the fields. However, they were under constant scrutiny from the owner. These people had less privacy. They organized the entire, their entire lives around meeting their owner's family's needs, whether it was cooking and cleaning, doing just common household chores, sewing. For women slaves, they became surrogate mothers to babies and to little kids. Um, there was various things I read where the slaves that lived in the homes kind of became as playmates, or like I said, they became these surrogate parents to these little kids, but they had to call these little kids master or sir or ma'am. Something also of note that might be interesting is the fact that owners tried to keep the slaves in the home separate from the slaves out in the fields. They created these two different classes, these two different groups, whereas whether they wanted to or not, the slaves working in the house probably ended up feeling a little more high and mightier than those working out in the fields. So I've talked about the working conditions of slaves. Now let's kind of delve into the living conditions of slaves. First off, let's talk about their diet. Now their diet, to say the least, was extremely inadequate to meet the heavy workload that they were expected to do each and every day. They consumed the worst foods, kind of like the leftovers. Um, they'd have cornbread and pork was kind of a staple. Um, a quote from Booker T. Washington, who is a very well-known um, ex-slave who was able to get his freedom, and he said this, and I quote, A piece of bread here and a scrap of meat there, a cup of milk at one time and some potatoes at another. So as you can see, their food, it seems like, was very inconsistent with what they got and when and probably how much. They would also have what um, I, I researched was referred to as one-pot meals, which was a meal of some kind of meat, some kind of vegetable, and broth, which was used to stretch out meal proportions to make it seem like the little amount of food you're getting was actually a lot of food. Now, slaves would supplement their diet with hunting, and they hunted a variety of animals, which I'm sure a lot of us wouldn't necessarily want to eat. Um, possum was one, raccoon, snapping turtle, deer. It's important to note again, going back to servants, that their meals consisted of the leftover food that they cooked for their masters. So they were fed probably a little bit better quality food. Um, another quote from Booker T. Washington was that servants got meal, I'm sorry, slaves got meals like dumb animals get theirs. So whether that was how they got it served or the type of food they um, were given. Very, very sad. Moving on, let's talk about the uh, homes and health, as I called it. Now, they lived in very crude quarters uh, that were built either by the owners or the slaves had to build their own homes. Again, they were not giving the best quality materials to build their own homes, as you can see here. Um, there was very deplorable conditions. And because of these horrible conditions, they were vulnerable to many diseases. Um, they'd have a bare dirt floor. Their bed would be made of straw or old rags. And at times, it would fit in 10 people per hut. Now, as you can see in this picture, the clothing and bedding was very minimal. House slaves, again, to show the difference, lived usually in the house. Because again, a house slave organized their own life around meeting their master's needs. So they lived in the house. They also got their owner's old clothes. Now, for most slaves, it was very unsanitary conditions. They worked in humidity, it was poor nutrition, hard, hard labor, so it made it very easy to get sick. A final thing to talk about a little bit is that there was a lot of abuse against women, and it was rampant. The owners and the overseers took advantage of the power that they had over these women, and of course, the men who, who saw these women as aunts, grandmas, mothers, sisters, maybe even wives, had no power whatsoever to stop the abuse that the owners and overseers used and did. So we've talked a lot about the owners and overseers. Let's talk a little bit more about how these men um, controlled their slaves. Owners and overseers are responsible for the discipline on the plantations. Um, sometimes owners and overseers weren't very violent, and sometimes they weren't violent very often. However, these were different tools that they used to control their slaves. 
um, whipping, using chains and shackles, um, putting slaves in jails, or some of the more negative ways that overseers and plantation owners controlled their slaves. However, sometimes this negative didn't work and they had to result to more positive ways to control their slaves. So at times, slaves would be given small garden plots where they might be allowed to sell items. Sometimes they gave gifts of money or food kind of at the end of the year to reward those slaves who worked extremely hard. Now an overseer's job really was to break a slave's hope of freedom. In fact, some overseers thought that a good slave thought themselves less than human. Their goal for, for some of these overseers was that they would get a slave to not care about their own self. So again, I need you to think about that. Another human's job was to make a human not care about themselves, to not think of themselves as human. Another way that the Southern owners um, controlled their slaves was by getting laws created called slave codes. And this was a way um, to control a slave's behavior. But these codes were brought on because they had such a fear of the slaves rebelling. Remember, there were a lot of slaves, and in some cities, more slaves than white folk. So there was a huge fear of rebellion in that. This labor force would rise up and would destroy all of the white Caucasian people. So slave codes were a way to kind of keep that in check. Some examples of slave code were that you could not teach a slave to read or write. Slaves are not allowed to have contracts. Can you think of something that could be a contract? Buying, selling, owning, getting married involves a contract. Legally, slaves couldn't get married. Legally, in fact, slaves couldn't even have children. If slaves had a child, that child didn't belong to the rightful parents. It belonged to the owner, who probably had no love for that child. Another interesting, or not interesting, but another part of the slave code was that um, slaves could not gather in more than five people away from a plantation unless there was a white individual with them. Now, the very last thing I want to talk about is how slaves resisted slavery. Slaves didn't just sit back and let all these terrible things happen to them. In fact, one of the most common ways to resist slavery was more day-to-day -day items, such as breaking tools, pretending to be sick so you wouldn't have to work, having slowdowns where you'd work not so efficiently and fast. Hey, I wonder if students ever do slowdowns. And they'd also sabotage whatever they were working on. They also ran away. And there really were two reasons to run away. First, just for your freedom. Um, sometimes a lot, of, a lot of people, as we know, would go north. Um, but sometimes people went south to the swamps. Another reason people ran away was to withhold their labor, was to negotiate better treatment, whether it was to be allowed to get married or maybe work not so hard. As one of the places I read when I was doing research for this flip video said is that slavery was a lot about negotiating. Now, I don't know how true this was and how much negotiating occurred between an owner and a slave, but it could be a possibility. A final way that slaves resisted slavery was by revolting, by rising up. Now this didn't happen quite as much, but it did. But this happened a lot though when, or happened more I should say, when slaves outnumbered their white masters or when the master was absent. Well, thank you for watching this flip video. It was a little longer because we had a lot to cover. Um, slavery is, is an institute, was an institution that needs to be studied so we do not repeat the same mistakes. And to do that, we need to see how horrible and how evil slavery was. So I apologize if any of this bothered anyone. We will have one more video about um, slavery and a slave's life. Please check in Moto for your homework questions, and I'll see you in class.